We start with Ambassador Mark Regev, Senior Advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Ambassador Regev, thank you for being with us. Let's talk about the hostages. My pleasure. They were Israel's responsibility, clearly. Uh, these revelations are heartbreaking, I know, to Israel, to their families. Um, what can you tell us about, apparently, they were, they escaped during a firefight between Israeli forces trying to free hostages who killed their captors, but the dog's camera was then analyzed and showed what had happened and they had gotten away. Correct. Unfortunately, we didn't have that information in real time. It could have saved the lives of those three hostages. In fact, the intelligence briefing that our troops on the ground received was to expect to see hostages in some underground dungeon, in a, in a tunnel, in some dark room where they were held hostage. There wasn't an expectation that our hostages would be walking around the streets. And, and that was obviously a, a lapse because that's exactly where we, they were. And they were, as you know, inadvertently shot, a tragedy, a real tragedy, not just for the families, first and foremost for the families, but for the IDF and for all Israelis, a terrible, terrible tragedy. And, and do we know how they managed to survive for those five days? I guess that would be hard to determine. I, I don't know where. If, if, if they'd be alive, they could tell us their stories. Unfortunately, they can't. We can only make hypotheses. But the, it's clear that they were very brave young men, very capable of dealing with, with adversity. The mere fact that they escaped their captors, I think, uh, means they all deserve a medal. But it, it ended in such a tragic way. We can only feel for their families. Uh, any... Uh, uh, what, what the experts, what the military calls blue-on-blue -blue deaths, friendly fire deaths, so it's always tragic. But this is even more so because these were civilians, and the goal of the IDF is to save these people and to inadvertently, accidentally to, to kill them is a terrible, terrible thing. And now Hamas has said it will not negotiate. At least that's what's coming out of Egyptian sources, where Hania, the, the leader of Hamas, was uh, just earlier this week, that they won't negotiate for a deal until... A deal that Israel had offered for a ceasefire, perhaps of seven days, uh, but until there's a complete, rather a humanitarian pause for seven days and more hostage releases until there's a complete ceasefire. Is that the state of play as far as you know it? I apologize, Andrea, but I'm not permitted to go into any details as of the talks. I can only tell you the following. We're, we're in communications with the Americans, with the Qataris, with the Egyptians, and we will not waste any real opportunity that exists to get our people out. Uh, as you know, there, there's over 100 people still being held by Hamas, and we worry about them, and we fear for them. We know what Hamas is capable of. We saw the violence that Hamas committed on October 7th, and we've heard the stories of the, the first group of hostages that were released, those that were released at the end of November, and we heard about the physical and psychological abuse that they went through, including the children. And so, of course, we're worried. Hamas is brutal. They're not going to suddenly release these hostages because they're suddenly going to respect humanitarian law. No, they will respond, as President Biden said, they will respond to pressure. And we believe increasing the pressure, the military pressure, the IDF's pressure on the Hamas military machine, that can expedite the release of hostages because Hamas understands that we will only agree to a pause in the fighting for the release of hostages. And if Hamas wants that pause, as we increase the pressure, they will increasingly want that pause. We believe we will get more people out. Now, I do want to play some more of that Sky News reporting from inside Rafa. This was moments after an Israeli strike. There are screams of desperation and the sounds of sirens as the Israeli drone circles overhead with the threat of more incoming missiles. There are women underneath here, one man shouts. The body of a dead child is found and taken away on a stretcher. We don't know why the Israeli military hit this target, but people in Gaza had been told that Rafa was safe. Now, the question is, Rafa was supposed to be a safe area. It's in the south, and it was right outside a hospital where that took place. Our, the, our Sky News correspondent was right there, so this is not anecdotal. Um, so Israel, Israel's been, and, oh, let's just put it this way, you've had Jake Sullivan, you've had you know, Defense Secretary Austin, you've had Tony Blinken, all very publicly, and the President of the United States saying 
that Israel has to do a better job of targeting and of trying to minimize the casualties. Um, does, isn't this an example of that not, not taking place? So I understand this is an example of that exactly taking place. There was a target of opportunity in Rafah, a senior Hamas commander. We surgically strike the building where he was, um, and he, of course, was next to a hospital because that's how Hamas work. They always try to embed themselves using the civilians and humanitarian sites like hospitals, schools, uh, mosques, and so forth as a shield for their military machine. I understand there was no damage to the hospital. We hit the target we wanted to hit. Of course, because Hamas is an authoritarian uh, ruler, a, a brutal ruler, uh, no one can say to the cameras anything but the Hamas line, yes? But my understanding was this was a surgical strike against a terrorist commander, uh, and uh, there was no little... In fact, if you look at the smoke that I can see now on the screen, you see it's a very specific strike against a specific location. Uh, this is not some sort of indiscriminate targeting of civilians. Far from it. And did you manage... Did you get the, the commander that you were trying to get? That's not clear to me. My briefing is a few hours old, and I, I'm, not, I'm not aware if we got the man uh, that we intended to. I hope we did, of course. But once again, this is a surgical strike and uh, for a, a, a target of opportunity. When, when one of these people appears on the screen and we can get him, we'll get him, just as you would have, the Americans would have, if there was a, a senior al-Qaeda or ISIS person. These are our enemies. These are the people who commanded the October 7th atrocity, where they where they burnt people alive, where they beheaded people, where they raped and then murdered women. Terrible crimes against humanity, and the people responsible will be brought to justice. And is there any prospect of getting more hostages out, uh, the women who have still not come out, some of the elderly people? Well, we hope so. And we spoke about that a moment ago. We think as we beef up the military pressure on Hamas's military machine, and they become more desperate for a, for a pause in the fighting, Maybe we can get these people out, but you're right. There's a group of men over the age of 70 uh, uh, being still held hostage with, with numerous health uh, uh, problems. There was uh, some terrible propaganda videos they put out recently, I, I know you know, uh, of three elderly men, uh, uh, 179, two over 80, uh, uh, still being held by Hamas. There are the women uh, that Hamas promised to release in, in the first grouping, and then they suddenly reneged, and they didn't release. But uh, there's, what is it, 17 uh, women and children still uh, 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 held by Hamas. These are people that Hamas agreed to release in a list. And as you heard the White House uh, uh, saying, Hamas had agreed to this list and they reneged on their commitment. And I think we have to understand who we're dealing with. We're dealing with ruthless terrorists. We're dealing with very, very difficult people. And, of course, any attempt to, to get our hostages out will always be difficult. It's always like pulling teeth. It's very, 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 very painful. We'll succeed. In the end, we will get people out. But we have to be patient and we have to do this right. And beefing up the pressure on Hamas is the way to expedite release of hostages. And there are reports that you are not succeeding in getting the key commanders you've been trying to get. Uh, is that a disappointment so far? So, so far, we've, we've hit a lot of their command structure, but you're right, the, the, the two or three people at the top of the Hamas pyramid are, are still uh, evading us, but that's only a matter of time. We will get them. It took the United States a, a while to, to get bin Laden, uh, uh, but in the end, you got him. It'll take us a lot less time to get these people. We know where they are. We know the area where they're hiding. It's just a matter of time. And we will eliminate Hamas's senior leadership. As I said before, uh, uh, these people who are responsible for the most atrocious, gruesome crimes against humanity. Uh, uh, what happened on October 7th was the largest single terror attack since 9-11 in the United States. And it was the largest act of anti-Semitic violence, murder, since the terrible years of the Holocaust. These people will be found and justice will be done.